Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of How Do You Do That? I'm your host, John Pham. So we've had two interviews so far, and the majority of the podcast is going to be uh, me interviewing other people, trying to solicit and elicit uh, knowledge that might be helpful, maybe things that they didn't teach you in school, all in an effort to help us find work that we love. With the holidays coming up, I've been trying to schedule folks to come in to, to be interviewed. Um, we're also going to be going back to Oklahoma for a couple weeks, and so I'm trying to get some interviews there as well. I um, mean, that's been a bit of a challenge. So today, what I want to do is dive into a book that I've been reading, actually. So I've been listening to this as an audiobook, and I just finished it this week. And I picked it up because I thought it was really relevant to the podcast. And the book is called So Good That They Can't Ignore You. It's by Cal Newport. And I think it really applies to what I'm trying to do here, which is trying to understand how people find the work that they love. And when I saw this book and just read a summary of it, it looked like it would really apply to what I'm doing as well. It was actually written in 2012. So even 10 years later, um, I find that it's still very relevant. And one of the things that I've been trying to do more often is read, you know, this isn't that old, but older texts and older books in general, because things that are older, they've stood the test of time. A lot of news and articles that come out on a day-to-day -day basis, it just draws for your attention, but it doesn't necessarily stand the test of time. And so there's nothing to be said about books and texts that have been around for a long time because they obviously are still continuing to offer value. Let me dig into this. Cal Newport, if you haven't heard of him, he's written other books like Deep Work, which was published in 2016, which is all about why deep work is important and how it can drive a lot of efficiency and productivity and how those who are able to connect with deep work can accomplish more than those who may be doing shallow work because you end up doing a lot of context switching, which drains a lot of energy. I highly recommend it. It's a great book. I'm not doing it justice by any means. And then one of his most recent ones is uh, Digital Minimalism, which was very timely. It came out before COVID. It's about how technology has evolved and how a lot of these Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and others have studied casinos and dopamine and, and how humans respond to these little dopamine hits and when to give them. These big companies have figured this out and they are optimizing to keep our attention span. The Digital Minimalism book and the Deep Work book really go hand in hand and they're great productivity books. I'd highly recommend them. But for today, what I'd like to do is I'd like to focus on So Good They Can't Ignore You. So I listened to this book over the last week or so. And as I was listening to Cal Newport's book, I was taking notes in my phone because I was listening to it on Audible. And I found myself, you know, every couple of minutes just writing down a sentence, jotting down notes. And so what I want to do today is run you through the highlights of that book and how it might apply to your life, how I'm going to try to apply in my life, and how it's going to shape the podcast moving forward as well. So in Cal Newport's book, he shares four rules for finding work that you love. The first rule is don't follow your passion. He shares that following your passion is bad advice because many people don't know what their passion is or what they're passionate about, or maybe what they're passionate about isn't something that they can realistically turn into a career. This could be something like reading, right? Maybe that's not the most reasonable thing to turn into a career. And I've always agreed with this point that when people are like, oh, just follow your passion, that's easier said than done because you don't just wake up and you're like, oh, I'm passionate about this. You sort of discover it over time. And so I've always tried to strive to follow my curiosity instead, which is leaning into what I'm interested in, digging deeper and building upon that. And I believe that that leads you to your passion as you do it over time. So that's rule number one. Don't follow your passion. That's bad advice. Rule number two is be so good they can't ignore you. This rule is about what you should do instead of following your passion. So Cal identifies two paths to finding work you love. The first path is the passion mindset. The passion mindset is focusing on what the world can offer you. And what this tends to do is it makes you hyper aware of things that you don't like about work. And this can lead to chronic unhappiness in your job, which early on in your career, oftentimes you, you have to do a lot of work that you may not like. And typically early on in your career, there's not a lot of autonomy either. Even 
earlier on in my career, right after I had finished grad school, when I was working with GE at the time, a manager came to me one day and he said, hey, John, you know, I have some work for you to do. And he was really good about this. He was really understanding. He's like, hey, um, this work kind of sucks. It's kind of manual, but we really need you to do it. And, you know, you're going to learn this. You're going to learn how to approach somebody and ask them to do this kind of work because it's just the nature of it. It's valuable, but it's not going to be fun. And I really appreciated that. And I knew that if I could handle this and do this and do it well, that my responsibilities would grow. And sure enough, each time I stepped up and did things that people didn't want to do, that led to new opportunities as well. And so the first mindset is this passion mindset, right? This focus on what can the world or what can the job offer you? The second mindset is the craftsman mindset. And the focus here is what can you offer the world? This mindset leads you to figuring out how to offer value that other people appreciate. I guess I was kind of forced to adopt this mindset, but it's one that comes a little more naturally to me as well. And Cal argues that no one really owes you a great career, right? Like you have to own it and you have to build towards it. Passion follows after adopting a craftsman mindset to get better, which makes a lot of sense, right? As you get better at your role and you become better at what you do, it'll become easier for you, more natural for you, and you'll enjoy that process a lot more as well. So On our way to finding work that we love, Cal defines three traits that make great work and make for a great role. The first is creativity, the second is impact, and the third is control. So most dream jobs have all of these traits in one way or another, maybe mixed in different levels, but these are probably the three most critical traits for finding work that you love. They should allow you to be creative, It should allow you to create impact and you should have some control or a lot of control and autonomy over what you work on and how you work. If you're thinking about, you know, which of these traits does my job have, which one does it not have, you might realize that it may not necessarily have all of these areas to the extent that you'd like them to have. And I would bet that most people would say that I have one or two of these things, but maybe not all three, or I have all three of these things, but not to the level that I want. And if most people are saying that, what that means is that these jobs are rare and they're valuable, right? So Cal says that because that these jobs are rare and valuable, you have to build up rare and valuable skills or what he calls career capital to offer in return. And I had never thought about career capital in the sense of supply and demand. I had always thought of career capital as like, hey, you know, I'm going to develop all these skills and then find my next gig and my next growth opportunity. But this framework of I'm going to build up these skills and this knowledge, and I'm going to use this career capital to trade that in for more control, more opportunities to be creative, and more opportunities to be impactful as well. So that puts us at an interesting spot, right? Like early on in your career, there's a gap. The things that you create really aren't that good yet. You haven't done it for a long time. You may have some natural skill sets, but there are people that have had similar talents and natural skill sets, and they've been doing it for decades, right? And they've been iterating. They're just as talented as you. And so there's this gap, right? So how do we close that gap and get closer to building more career capital? How can we be intentional about building career capital? What Cal argues is that deliberate practice is the way to get there. Deliberate practice can help you gain as much career capital as possible. And so what does deliberate practice mean? This means intentionally designing activities to improve specific aspects of one's performance and actively seeking feedback from others to refine those skills. And this makes a lot of sense to me. Most of us are probably going to be knowledge workers, and there's really not a clear path to development. And so as you're working on developing skills, you have to actively seek that feedback from others because you may not naturally get that. The feedback loops are not as quick as, let's say, chess or golf, where you get almost instant feedback, right? Like if you make a bad move, somebody takes your queen, you're going to be sad. If you hook a ball, slice it, you're going to see that pretty immediately. But when it comes to knowledge work, you may not see that impact. You may not even get feedback for an extended amount of time. And so you have to actively... Seek that feedback so you can keep improving. After this, Cal dives into five steps on how you can apply deliberate practice in your work. So step one, he says you have to understand what type of capital market you're competing in. Is it a winner-take-all market or is it an auction market? 
in a winner take all market, there's only one type of career capital available. For example, blogging, right? You don't really need skills like SEO or formatting. The skill that matters the most in that market is writing well and creating compelling posts. And then there are auction markets where there's a a variety of relevant skills that could lead you to have a great job in this field. Step two is then you have to identify what type of career capital that you're after. So what skills do you need to be great at your job? For a winner-take-all market, this is pretty straightforward. For auction markets, Cal says that we should seek open gates or opportunities that are already available. His whole argument is that open gates get you farther faster. Essentially what an open gate is, is if you are already working in a certain industry and you've already built up some career capital there, it's easier to keep finding opportunities and keep trading in your career capital that you've developed for the next opportunity where you can further your skill sets and continue to grow. Whereas if you start from scratch in a new field, that's a lot more challenging. So once you've decided what type of capital market you're in and you've identified the type of career capital that you're looking for, the next goal is to define what is good. Like what's the benchmark? And then the next step is what he says is to stretch and destroy. What he's like stating here is that to keep growing, you have to stretch yourself, right? And stretching is oftentimes really uncomfortable, especially when you're getting feedback and the feedback isn't positive. Even though it's helpful, it can hurt sometimes and sting a little bit, especially if you're like putting your best work out there and knowing that, oh, it's not quite there yet or it's not quite good enough yet. But this is exactly what he means by destroy, right? Like even if it destroys what you believe is good, getting that kind of feedback is going to be really valuable and helping you shape and build career capital. So embrace the honest feedback. And then the final step, which I think is really important, which I'm not very good at, is patience. So acquiring capital takes time. So you have to have the patience knowing that putting all your effort in acquiring the career capital you need, that there's going to be a payoff in the future. The encouragement here is to stay focused and to know that it's coming. There's going to be a payoff day. Ignore the distractions and continue to grind it out. There's another book that I read called War of Art that really talks about this beautifully. Once you're starting to build towards something and you're trying to develop those skills, there's always this sense of procrastination and there are all these distractions and shiny new things and it can distract you from what you're called to do. And in the War of Art, it's called resistance. And there's all this resistance keeping you from doing that. This is about focusing and ignoring those distractions and getting through the resistance. All right, so let me run through the steps again. Step one, decide what type of market you're competing in. Step two, identify what your capital type is. Step three, define what good is. Step four, stretch and destroy. And step five, have some patience. All right, so we know that deliberate practice is how you get better. One question that Cal addresses is, when is it better to stick it out to develop mastery And when does it make sense to quit a job or a role to find another opportunity where you can develop your career capital faster? Cal shows three things that disqualify a job from this. The first is if the job has few opportunities to develop rare and valuable skills. So if you're not getting growth opportunities, then it's time to dip. The second one is if you're working on something that's useless or bad for the world, probably time to go as well. And the third one is if the job forces you to work with people you dislike. So I think all of these are really helpful. Like if you're not growing, then this goes against building career capital. If you're working on something useless or that's bad for the world, there's a lot of other great products and services out there that you can develop skills for while also creating impact along the way. And a lot of research has been done around if you work with people you dislike, oftentimes people don't quit the jobs that they do. They actually quit their managers And so it's really important that you find people you enjoy working with, especially when we put in so many hours at work. I really agree with these three, these three items. All right. So rule one was following your passion is bad advice. Rule number two was be so good that they can't ignore you and why you should adopt a craftsman mindset and how to use deliberate practice to develop career capital. Rule number three, he calls it a turn down or promotion or the importance of control. Now that you have developed and you've acquired career capital, the next step is to invest this career capital or trade it in for the traits that define great work. 
gaining control over what you do and how you do it has often shown up in the lives of people who love what they do. Cal shares two control traps that we should try to avoid. The first control trap is enthusiasm alone is not enough career capital to trade for control. I'm going to say that again. Enthusiasm alone is not enough career capital to trade for control. So even if you're really excited about something and really passionate about something, if you only have enthusiasm, you can't just drop everything and pursue what you're passionate about. You may end up getting a lot of autonomy, but it's probably not going to be sustainable, right? Like you might not be able to put the next meal on the table. And so it's really important to develop career capital first before you start to trade it in for control. The second control trap is at the point that you do have enough career capital, you'll become valuable enough to your employer that they'll prevent you from making this change or making the exchange for more control. Cal's encouragement here is to continue to cash that in and fight for more control over the work that you do. One way you can avoid the control trap is by using what Cal calls the law of financial viability. Do what people are willing to pay for. And so you want to seek this evidence to see if people are going to be willing to pay for what you do so that you're not just moving on on enthusiasm alone. And if they are willing to pay, then continue to move on and keep pursuing it. And his argument here is that because money is a neutral indicator of value, by understanding if people are willing to pay for it and by aiming for money, you're aiming to be valuable. So this is a good law to to follow. I think he just gave it a fancy name, but it does sound pretty good. Law of financial viability. So do what people are willing to pay for. Rule number four, which is the last rule, is think small and act big, or the importance of mission. We've already talked about control. We've talked about creativity. The other pillar is impact and the importance of mission, right? To achieve success and fulfillment in your career, it's essential to have a clear and inspiring mission. This mission will give your work purpose and provide motivation to overcome challenges. If you focus your efforts on a specific goal, you can maximize your impact and increase the likelihood that you'll enjoy what you do. So Cal's encouragement here is to move towards the cutting edge. And once we discover what's adjacent possible to what's currently cutting edge, then we can start to make these bigger bets once we've acquired enough career capital. Oftentimes we think that we have to start with this big idea and we're going to execute on it. But Cal's argument here is move to the cutting edge. And then he says, make small bets and learn and gather the feedback. So rather than going, shoving all your chips in, into one area and not knowing if that's going to work or not, Cal says move to the cutting edge and make small bets and get feedback and see what works. He even encourages us to gain a lot of critical information from lots of failures. Then Cal says that to turn a great mission into a great success, you have to find projects that fulfill the law of remarkability. So Cal really enjoys creating new laws. And the law of remarkability means that it needs to be compelling enough And there needs to be a mechanism for people to remark on. So it should be something that people want to share. And there should be an avenue for people to share how remarkable this mission is. Essentially, what he's arguing here is that if you follow this principle, then you increase your chance of achieving your mission or making your mission a success. And this part really resonated with me because one thing that I've tried to do in my career is I've tried to move closer and closer to the cutting edge. I think what I'll really take away from this book is this idea of the craftsman mindset and developing my craft. And I love the idea of trading in career capital and this supply and demand trade-off that you're able to build up career capital and trade it for a job or a role that you really love. And this really just reminded me of a manager that once told me that every two to three years, you should interview and see if there are new roles that might provide more opportunities or more growth. And during this process, you'll probably land in one of two places. One, you'll either find a new opportunity that is exactly the right next step. Or two, you'll realize that, hey, where I'm currently at is actually pretty good and I'm learning a lot. My main takeaway is that you don't just arrive at your passion. It's really this journey of developing skills, making strategic moves, And then eventually getting there. But the big focus on, I think, for a lot of us early on in our careers is developing career capital and trying to figure out what kind of market we're in and where we can leverage our skill sets. If you continue to work on your craft and become so skilled that you can't be ignored, 
that'll mean that you'll have enough career capital to get to do the work that you love. And so I think that's the biggest takeaway for me. And this will really shape how I move forward with the podcast as well. With this framework in mind, as I interview guests, one of the things that I'm going to be looking for is how did they develop their career capital? At what points did they trade it in? What does that look like across industries? How did they figure that out? And I think it just provides a lot of context and a framework around how to think about finding work that you love. And that's why I was really excited to digest it and share this with you. Like I said earlier on in the podcast, most of these episodes will be interview based. And I've got a lot of exciting guests lined up for the next couple of weeks and into the new year. I'm looking forward to learning more with you and sharing with you these stories that I hope will help inspire you, help you find work that you love and spark your curiosity to lean in further and to learn more. And so if you're enjoying this podcast or if you have any feedback or thoughts on things you'd like to hear more of, please don't hesitate to reach out. I really enjoy hearing from you. One of the things that you can do is you can leave a message on the Spotify app. If you click on the episode and go to the descriptions and scroll down to the bottom, there's a little link there that will allow you to leave a voice message, which would be really cool. But if you don't want to do that, you can also email me at itsjohnfam at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and looking forward to the next episodes with you all. Take care.